Okay, hello everyone. My name is Charles Nyabeze and I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization with the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation out of Sudbury, Ontario. Welcome. The Bradshaw Research Initiative for Minerals and Mining, BRIM, and the Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator, MICA Network, are pleased to present day two of the future of biotechnology in mining. Today's session is featuring cross-Canada expertise. But before we jump into our presentation, we would like to acknowledge that the UBC Vancouver campus is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Wasquim, Squamish, Selwitlum, and Tesli Rotom nations. As we are currently working from home, we would like all of you to acknowledge the land on which all of you, each of you is, is currently located. Pou Eside à la interprétation en français, cliquez sur le bouton interprétation dans le panel de Zoom. Please post your questions for the panel in the question and answer channel and use the chat for discussions during the webinar. Any questions you have could be emailed to jfengler at bremubc.ca and it's on your screen. Thank you for joining us. To kick off our event today, I'd like to introduce you to our first panelist, Dr. Nadia Mitikchak. And she'll be speaking to you about advancing new biotechnologies in mining, the role of applied research and SMEs. Dr. Nadia, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Charles. And thank you to all of the organizers uh, and panelists today for engaging in this uh, excellent webinar series. Um, and we're starting off day two. So uh, in my presentation today, although I come from an academic uh, research background, I now wear a new hat as the CEO um, and president of Morocco, which is a applied research corporation. And with this lens, I'd like to talk about advancing biotechnologies and specifically the role of applied research and SMEs in carrying this research forward. So a little bit about Morocco. Uh, we are an applied research corporation with over 20 years experience primarily working in developing solutions for hard rock mining, issues around geomechanics, safety, software development, and energy. But traditionally, there was also a rehabilitation arm as part of Morocco, and with my joining of the team, I'm also bringing in um, biomining and bioremediation as an additional research arm that we've been working on. So as an applied research corporation, we're really looking at um, carrying solutions from the bench and towards commercialization. But that path is actually quite long um, and one that we have to work on collaboratively. So we heard a lot uh, from the panelists yesterday and sort of the opportunities and challenges that we have uh, in advancing, developing and advancing biotechnologies specifically with, um, uh, for the mining industry. We've already heard about the opportunity to uh, improve extraction opportunities for low-grade ores, mine wastes, improving treatments for some of these wastes, including solid and liquid residues. The challenge that we really see is how do we develop and integrate these new tools and genomics and apply them to existing best practices and engineering and geochemistry and others. In order to do that, we also have to talk about integrating expertise of biosciences into the everyday operations and lingo that is happening at mining um, operations and something that the environmental sector has already had several decades of working on. So we, we can learn from that um, integration and partnership. One thing that we haven't really talked about and something I'm not really gonna touch on, but we should put somewhere in our minds is that the future of biotechnologies as applied in mining also requires that we have that regulatory and policy approval so that these new tools and technologies can become integrated and part of uh, the toolbox that mining companies and service companies can use. Of course, this isn't an exhaustive list, many more there, but these are some of the key ones that uh, we're working on on some of the projects that we have. So when we talk about carrying biotechnologies and the future of uh, incorporating these technologies into mining, we look at uh, technology readiness levels. We know very well that the primary ideas often come from academia and these novel solutions that are developed on the bench or in government research labs, but that only takes it uh, part of the way. 
we then have to sort of mature and scale up that technology. And that really falls in the hands of applied research, of which there are a handful of institutes that are specifically focused on these types of challenges in Canada. Morocco is one of them, BRIM is another, there are other groups like C-Tree and CoREM that are trying to help expand and fill this gap um, so that we can carry these solutions towards the end of this line in commercialization, where we often hand off uh, the technology and work with the technology providers, incubators to finally take that technology and have it ready for application in the industry. So let's step back a bit. I was going to talk a little bit about how the genomics revolution has really entered into the mining space, but we had excellent presentations yesterday <clears throat> that really introduced this idea of exploding the black box and how genomics tools have helped us understand the diversity of microbial communities, what those genomic data tell us and how we can apply them to look at something like ideal species for a particular application, the importance of certain consortia that are available um, and actually look at um, how we can advance particular solutions using genomics tools to help optimize them. One thing I'd like to uh, outline, these are just very detailed, very colorful cards. We've already started a lot of that applied research in academia. This is one example from the Elements of Biomining Network, a program that we've just started to wrap up between the University of Toronto, Laurentian University, and UBC, where we were looking at some of these questions, whether it was extracting value from waste, looking at ways of passivating or remediating mine waste, or the work that you heard from Dr. Sue Baldwin yesterday in, in remediating selenium. All of these have been trying to help move those and integrate those biotechnologies and genomics tools um, into these very large questions. One example that I'm going to give you is the project that we were working on um, with Backtech Environmental, looking at developing an optimal bioleaching culture for a variety of mine waste. And you can see how heterogeneous they are. We started work on the bench describing the microbial community, who's there, can it help us extract gold? We moved up to slightly larger bioreactors, looking at the, the biology, geochemistry, and linking the two together. But of course, as I showed you with the TRL levels, there's additional scales that have to be proven up before we can see this as a viable technology at the industrial scale. A little more detail on the research that we completed, just to show you how some of the integration works. We had a very heterogeneous mix of materials. We threw a whole lot of different microbial cultures at it, and we wanted to see how could we define that ideal mixture of biology that could tackle this pretty challenging chemistry and extract what we want, which was more gold and be able to stabilize a contaminant like arsenic. One little geochem plot that I'm not gonna um, describe, but just to show you that we could apply one particular material with different microbial cultures and you get variable results. You can see in the little table on the right that it does, it does matter who's there in that community because you're going to get different processes and different outputs at the end of it. We wanted to dig into this microbial community a little bit more. And as we monitored, we used DNA um, amplicon sequencing to monitor the community over time. So through this bioleaching process, what's happening in the reactor? And as you can see from these colored bars and a lot of variability is that who we put in at the beginning doesn't always succeed and doesn't always carry through what we were hoping would be a dominant culture that is carrying out the reactions that we need. In this particular case, breaking apart the sulfides and allowing us to extract that gold. So without going into any of the species, the big takeaway from here is that we have to do this work and we have to use these genomic tools to be able to explain that variability that could occur at a large scale and basically make the process ineffective uh, or inefficient. When we were digging down into the data, and this is some of the work that, uh, or some of the tools that Aria introduced yesterday, it's more than just about who's there. It's using that genomic data to be able to tell us who is, uh, or who's capable of doing what, and targeting specific functional genes that let us know um, what we need to do. If we're thinking of scaling up, we also have to think about real time and how do we move uh, these genomics tools into something that can be used by operators. 
So I'll show this slide again, just to highlight that before we can take what we have as novel solutions into industry, we have to make sure the genomics tools scale, do they work in real time, and can they be applied in operations? So in order to solve these challenges and sort of the big um, shift that we've had to make, myself as a researcher and now as the lead of Morocco, can we develop centers that can really carry these technologies and incubate them the rest of the way? And the idea of developing a center for mine waste biotechnology specifically focused on biomining, bioremediation applications, maturing these technologies together and trying to accelerate their application um, to mining end uses. So with the center, what we're hoping to do and that you see the TRL levels again at the top, we're really hoping to take what has started out in the bench, academic partnerships, working with industry, but not necessarily scaled up yet, and really taking that all the way to the end in offering a facility that allows piloting and demonstration, one that builds in um, bench to market support for that maturing of technologies, being able to integrate expertise from the variable groups that have to be there so that we're asking the right questions and addressing the right um, sort of bottlenecks that might be present in applying any kind of new technology in industry. So when we talk about those partnerships, I have this little diagram at the top and you can see that applied research and SMEs or private sector have to be integrated if we want to accelerate that uh, advancement and making sure we're, we're providing the right solutions um, for industry. So you can see academic research with anchor tenants or the private sector end users are working together with multiple lenses. We have to have the right research expertise, asking the right questions, developing the right solutions, make sure that we have commercialization support and understanding of what it actually takes to commercialize those processes. We are only going to be able to achieve this collaboratively and working with expertise across different stakeholder groups, not only academia, government, industry, private sector, and community. And of course, we have to train people to be able to apply these new technologies in industry. We have multiple goals in the center. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to check my chat, which I forgot to open, and I think Janice is probably texting me right now. I'm going to speed up a little bit. The goals of the center that you can see here, many of which I've already touched on, not only providing the facility, but a location where we can bring in all of the expertise needed to provide not only proof of concept, but scalable solutions and help accelerate um, moving something to commercialization. Fostering, of course, those partnerships, market confidence, and, and demonstrating that these are mature uh, solutions that then can be handed off to technology providers and SMEs or uh, the industry uh, operators themselves. Looking at promoting entrepreneurship and leveraging and finding these synergies uh, between all these groups is a key goal of the center. So in terms of next steps, of course, this is uh, quite new. I've got my feasibility in hand and, and this, um, uh, forum right here as part of those early discussions of bringing in different groups like MICA, like BRIM, like Morocco and others to start working together to really find that the, the powerhouse that's needed to quickly develop, scale up, proof and commercialize technologies and biotechnologies for um, applications in mining. So with all of these components that um, we have as our marching orders, I think it's critical that we have to look at biotechnologies and the future of those technologies and mining from the beginning all the way through to the end um, in those TRL levels and making sure that we have that path laid out for any single application. With that, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, all of our support and partnership and all of the presenters uh, that are coming um, today because uh, we have a great cross-section of these very stakeholders giving us those different lenses in our discussion today. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mikdichak. Uh, really appreciate your presentation. And uh, we will be wrapping, coming, coming back to bring Dr. Uh, Mikdichak to, to the panel discussions at the end of the presentation. Uh, now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Leslie Warren, and Dr. Leslie Warren is going to be speaking to us on genomics, powering sustainable mining 
Water Futures. Dr. Warren, please go ahead. Thank you. It's great to be here and it's great to have this focused conversation. I'm going to touch on a couple of messages which I think are coming through loud and clear in all of the presentations so far and really speak to some of our work using genomics in conjunction with geochemistry to understand sulfur compounds in wastewaters uh, across four mines in Canada. And for those of you who have maybe never seen a tailings pond before, this is a tailings discharge coming into a tailings pond. If you take a sample of that, it lights up like the Milky Way. This idea that these are just geotechnical materials that you need to deal with is, is just not true. They are completely coated with bacteria and understanding what these bacteria do is, is an opportunity that the industry needs to, to take on board. And I think, you know, when we look at sort of this nexus of mining, water and climate change, we know that revolutionary water solutions are imperative for climate solution success and mining is central to this. Water demands are already outstripping supplies. This is only going to be exacerbated as we move forward. Mining is in fact the second largest global user uh, after power generation. And of course the degraded wastewater that is generated poses massive risks to environments and communities and current technologies and strategies are pretty much tapped out. So they're inefficient. They do not 100% protect receiving environments. So we need to do better. And as we start to look at green supply chains and this idea that uh, sustainable development will sit on smarter sort of uh, green technologies, that is only going to require more mining because most of those technologies require more critical minerals and metals. And so that exacerbates our already growing water issue. So we've just got to do better. And this is, I think, where sort of this genomics, this, you know, application of molecular technologies to start interrogating the microbes that are present and others that are out there for sort of biotechnological strategies is one that is, is primed and ready for the industry. And again, just to touch on this, um, I think points that are really important to take home is that almost every context you want to think about, whether it's soils, the oceans, uh, deep underground, the human gut, built environment, there is a microbiome, a community of organisms that are adapted and specific to those particular contexts. They interact with those contexts, so they shape the outcomes of those contexts. And so, you know, we've, we've seen in the last 20 years as, as our technologies have grown and the prices come down, mechanistic investigation enabled by genomics technologies has really provided transformative new insights that are fueling ideas around big out culture, ocean carbon sequestration, cancer pandemics. If we flip to sort of mining, and again, just reiterating the opportunity that is here for the industry to jump on board, um, this is from a, a book chapter that will be coming out this year that uh, my group has been involved in. If you look at all of the, the studies that have been put on sort of the, the NCBI database, Mining represents less than 0.2%. And so these are fluorescent images of particles from the ocean and from a pyrotite tailings particle from a tailings pond. And you can see both light up like the Milky Way. So this idea that mining is not biogeochemically reactive is just simply false. The bugs are there. And this idea that we have these microbial black boxes, microbes are important. They're doing things in those environments that change outcomes, that change the water chemistry. They do it in different ways than geochemistry chemical models would predict. So we need to get on top of this. Um, and I think this idea that came up yesterday as well around systems investigation, it's not enough to just know about the bugs that are there or the genes that they have. We have to put it in context and understanding how systems think about our planet or an ocean or your garden. You know, it is the interaction of water with the rocks and the minerals and the chemicals and the bacteria in those systems that shape and influence the environmental characteristics. And we can do that. We can now bring in this sort of microbial piece to the equation, make those knowledge discoveries about the system based on process and mechanism. We can ask questions again, just reiterating who's there, what are they doing, how are they doing it, integrated with characterization of the chemistry of the system. The scale up and the, and the sort of commercialization will come later, but we need these knowledge discoveries to set fundamental baselines of key processes and who's involved. And you know, if you're still sort of wrapping your head around the fact that, that mining is important biogeochemically, if you look at the elements that bugs use to essentially gain carbon and energy, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, 
iron manganese are, are the big ones. You can also think about metals and trace elements that are capable of sort of losing or gaining electrons. These are all some of the big players in mining context. So from a microbial perspective, mining waste and wastewaters are in fact analogous to sort of uh, fast food. You can think of them as McDonald's. There are bugs that are going to be able to make a living and make a living very well there. So they are biogeochemically reactive contexts. And so I wanna talk a little bit about some of our work on sulfur, just to illustrate how important the genomics piece can be. Sulfur is incredibly important in mining. Most of the world's metals come from sulfide minerals. That means that most mines that are processing for things like cobalt, copper, zinc, lead, uh, cadmium are going to likely be processing sulfide materials. As they extract those metals, they create wastes that are sulfur rich. Um, probably the most well-known environmental issue associated with sulfur is acid mine drainage, the oxidation of sulfides that leads to very acidic water that's heavily uh, laden with high concentrations of metals. But there are many other issues that can come up from sulfur. And incidentally, acid mine drainage remains the mining issue, mining industry's number one pollution issue around the world. We still haven't got predictive sensitive, accurate, proactive measures in place that would allow mines to adapt and prevent this. Because once it starts, it's very difficult to turn off. And so if we look at sort of managed mining uh, waters, impacted and sort of wastewaters, there are a whole suite of reactive sulfur compounds that can occur. Essentially, as those oxidize, they can create things uh, that cause problems, such as oxygen consumption, which influences macrofauna like fish, but acidity, metal re release, contamination, toxicity. And of course, if this happens in the receiver and some of these sulfur compounds are recalcitrant to current treatment, so they make it through treatment into the receiving environment. If they start to cause issues there, this is where you start to see industry liability and risk. And so sulfur is a widespread issue for many mines um, and it's something we still haven't come to, to grips with. And just to sort of point out that a long-standing strategy to mitigate and prevent acid mine drainage is to put tailings under water covers because that limits exposure to oxygen, which is known without bacteria to essentially drive this uh, generation of acidity through the oxidation to sulfate. But as I'll sort of illustrate, there are many other ways that microbes can be playing with sulfur that we haven't yet come to grips with that can cause problems. So the Mining Wastewater Solutions Project was funded by Genome Canada and it's for um, mines, Hud Bay, Rambler, and Glencore Subri INO are our industry partners. It was a multinational, uh, multidisciplinary research team that came together to start understanding better what are the sulfur compounds that can occur in these contexts? What are the bugs that are involved? And how could that start to identify new runways to bio-inform uh, smarter tools for adaptive management and potentially treatment? And again, I think this idea of, you know, when we talk about systems, it's recognizing that there, are, you can't just think about how much water do you have or what's the chemistry of your water. You need to be thinking about the processes and how they're interacting together. So integrated systems, whenever life is involved, there are going to be differences over space and time. And so thinking about systems investigation means you don't just collect your samples from the side of the tailings pond. You think about how that system functions and differences that could be occurring from the top of it to the bottom of it. And so ours is sort of uh, spatially and temporally resolved, but integrating directly geochemistry with environmental data, with microbial data and microbial experimentation. So we start to build models and frameworks of what are the processes that are happening. Importantly, are they all the same kinds of processes happening across our four minds? Because if they are, we start to have the baseline for models that can work at other mine sites as well. And again, I just wanna point out and touch on a lot of these challenges, they're fixable, but they're also, they're fairly complex, right? These are not fixable with a $50,000 six month research project. It's gonna take some time to pull this together. So we know that sulfur itself is a very complicated element. It can occur in many different forms. It can be rapidly transferred amongst them. This is important because whether it's present as sulfide or tetrathionate or sulfite influences what it will do and what its potential um, impact could be. 
when we start to also build in that mines essentially create some sulfur compounds when they're milling sulfide ores and often predict what will happen in their tailings pond based on essentially what's coming out of the mill without thinking that once it enters the tailings pond, it's now entered essentially a bioreactor where microbes could be transforming those sulfur compounds, creating them or removing them. And so what they're predicting and managing from the mill isn't what's happening in the tailings pond. And there are a lot of question marks on this diagram because there's a lot of questions still around which bugs are involved, what do they do, what controls it. I also want to highlight, and um, Nadia, it was great that she came before me to point out that the chemistry can be a bit complicated and the genetics can too. And we don't have all the genetic pathways resolved yet. And we don't necessarily know all the genes that are involved. But similarly to the fact that there are multiple sulfur compounds, there are multiple sulfur genes that catalyze different reactions. And we're starting to fill in this because sulfur is important for sort of planetary biogeochemical cycling. So we can lean on a lot of work that's being done in other contexts in terms of what do we know about sulfur, the bugs involved, how are they doing it? So, but we, we have pieces of this in terms of what are the pathways, what are the genes involved? Which, and then you can start to put that together with the change in the chemistry. And so we started with very simple questions. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's often good to translate this down. It's like, do we have specific sulfur oxidizing bacteria present in these tailings ponds and receiving environments? Are there specific groups that can be identified that do different things? And if so, what are the outcomes of that, of having, let's say, group A and group B? And more importantly, what controls them? Because that starts to give you the idea that you've got some important levers you can pull in terms of using endemic microbes that are present in these systems. We may wanna beef them up a little bit, but levers you could use in your system to basically drive the system the way you wanna go and to try to mitigate when they start to do things you don't wanna do. So the first thing, and I, I'm racing through this because it, it, it is not a, a, a biogeochemistry or you know, full on metagenomics uh, presentation, but to give you a sense of what we can, we can distill out of this. When we look across our four mines, multiple times of the year, multiple parts of their water systems, their receiving environments. So it's, it's roughly about 400 samples to date, which I know is not uh, on the scale of what MMAP is proposing, but I think it gives you proof of principle of how useful this will be. What this shows you is, is sort of a pie diagram of who are the most common sulfur oxidizing bacteria that we see present across these four mines spread across Canada um, in terms of our tailings ponds and our receiving environments. And you can see we have the same sort of orange, yellow and green bugs that are present. So we're starting to see the legs to a mining water, uh, wastewater, impacted water microbiome. What's interesting about these uh, particular sulfur oxidizing microbes is that 40% of them we can't identify beyond family level. And this again makes sense. If not much investigation has gone on into these specific contexts, there are likely to be very many novel organisms that are specifically adapted to the conditions of, of mining context that we don't know very much about. But this really speaks to, we've got a distinct and discrete microbiome that's at play here and they're doing important things. What this figure shows you, what we're looking at now is essentially the amount of acid and sulfate that's being generated for different samples. So each of those gray bars represents a different mine sample, whether it's a parent water or receiving environment water that could have been collected at 35 meters or at the surface in October or June, doesn't matter. But we, what we do is we collect those water samples, we grow them under identical conditions. So we give them the same sulfur substrates, and then we track what happens to the chemistry, and we look at acid generation. And what you can see here is that we take those different waters, we grow them under identical conditions with the same recipe, they're generating different amounts of acid and sulfur. So they're doing different things, which suggests they're using different pathways and different processes. And indeed, when we look at who's there, what we see is that these yellow orange guys are the ones that are really driving sulfate and acid generation. The green ones, they're still processing sulfur, but they're doing it in a different way. And so we sort of um, 
use this sort of slang term of sort of fast and slow sulfur oxidizing bacteria. And we know this has to do with which pathways they're actually catalyzing, which genes are actually being expressed. And they're doing two very different things. And this is very useful because now we start to have a sense of, ah, you know, why are these mines failing their toxicity test? Because the geochemistry wouldn't have predicted that. But we're starting to see it's because of which of these groups of bacteria do they have? And so we've got a sense we've got fast and slow. We know they're important in these contexts. What controls them? Can we start to see are there levers to sort of push them more to fast or to push them to slow, which could be desirable depending on what part of the mining water system you're looking at. And in fact, if we think about pH and oxygen, which are two very important parameters in terms of biogeochemical controls, but also in terms of what mines will often be sort of managing for their water treatment. What you can see here is that the yellow, red, orange, which are our fast guys, really seem to play in the circumutral lower pH and more importantly, higher oxygen conditions. And this is where we see that, you know, more uh, fast oxidation chain happening higher sulfate and acidity generation. The slow guys really seem to, to do better at circumneutral to higher pH and under low oxygen conditions. And what this means is that when the slow guys are present, we have more of these reactive sulfur compounds present, which potentially is a risk if they're making it through treatment, so off mine property into the receiver. And incidentally, you can kind of see the gray uh, zone in a lot of polishing ponds, very high pHs. Typically, we're not seeing that sulfur oxidizers can, can, can do very well at those very high pHs. So this starts to be a way to start thinking about where do we want fast or slow to operate and what can we do to try to control them? And so just sort of, you know, we're really excited by this. I think, you know, if we look at top five takeaways, and I think this project was the first in Canada and, and the first in the world that we know of that looked across mine, combining geochemistry and, and omics technologies. Definitely there's a mining wastewater sulfur oxidizing bacteria microbiome. I think this is gonna be true of almost everything we look at in mining contexts. We can see that we have these different there and they operate across all our mines, the same bugs. They fall into these two groups, which has to do with which sulfur pathways are they catalyzing. So that different genes operate and we have signals of that. So we can indicate which pathways are operating. We're starting to see that there are ecological niches, so there are preferences for when they operate. So we're already starting to build essentially a biologically informed model that allows us to think about adaptive management, but better prediction. And those signals we're seeing associated with abundance changes and who's present and which genes are active on site relate to toxicity outcomes off site. And this is important for mines. If you can predict what's happening based on your microbial community in your managed water system, in terms of what's happening in your receiver and fix it, that really will help with that compliance. And so, you know, I really think this is just a, another example of hopefully this shift that's starting to happen where the industry, I think, can get behind this idea. This is such a massively underutilized opportunity, I think, to, to develop new ideas and new runways for better tools that, that are bioinformed. And this has to happen, I think, for mines to really demonstrate it is not just on their masthead that they're actually doing things that are moving to proactive water stewardship, which is what their stakeholders and investors are really looking for and will decrease their risk. So, you know, it's smart business practice. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you and it's been a pleasure to talk and I look forward to the panel. Awesome, thank you very much, uh, Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Warren for that uh, awesome presentation. Um, now, moving along to our next speaker, uh, it gives, gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Michael uh, Lynch, who is going to be speaking to us about uh, microbiome analysis using taxonomic and functional signatures. Michael, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much for uh, providing the opportunity for me to speak here. Um, yeah, as, uh, as was mentioned, I'm a director of bioinformatics at Metagenome Biolife Science uh, in Waterloo. And um, it's gonna get the, there we go. Uh, what we do at the company is we start, um, the core of our business model is DNA sequencing and analysis in our services uh, scope. And we do this on primarily the microbiome for 
various academic institutions and industry, as well as develop technology. Uh, these include inoculants, um, and STEM is our primary inoculant right now. So we provide, um, this provides growth promotion to plants, but we also develop microbial inoculants for specific purposes and goals for for industry clients and academic clients. Uh, we also have uh, soil and water DNA extraction kits that were designed with a diversity of, of soil types in mind. Uh, mining is one of those. Um, this can be adapted to a lot of different soil types. And we also have a system to detect pathogens in hydroponic environments. Um, the DNA extraction kits, these again uh, have superior DNA yields uh, with excellent quality, and they're fairly straightforward kits that do not have phenol and chloroform or pronases, uh, but follow a very straightforward protocol uh, that can be used in most lab environments and compatible with diversity of soil samples. Uh, it's called the, the SOX DNA kit, as well as the water kit. And I thought today I'd talk about a few different projects that demonstrate the capacities that metagenome bio. And we really follow two types of sequencing analysis. The sequencing of amplicons, where you sequence a single gene, uh, giving you a depth of analysis. And then um, the mixed microbial community sequencing the entire metagenome, which is sequencing all genes in a shotgun method. So you sequence everything and do that analysis. So that gives you a really broad um, analysis. So who is there is that amplicon sequencing. And what are they doing is that metagenomics or RNA-seq, this shotgun sequencing. And this figure on the <clears throat> uh, right-hand side, you see you know, the, the depth of the analysis. Once you get down to amplicon sequencing, you recover a very detailed picture of the entire microbial community. And when you're doing metagenomics, you don't get you know, as many members of that microbial community, but you, get a you learn a lot about what they're potentially doing. And we also develop these custom microbiome uh, bioinformatic analyses and workflows for our clients hand in hand. <coughs> and we really have this ecology first data intensive biology that answers questions based on what drives the ecosystem structure. And that also helps us guide this strain development. You know, what inoculants can we develop? And then developing and deploying these analytics workflows to clients or providing that service uh, at the company itself. So a lot of the times in this uh, marker sequencing, this, this amplicon sequencing, you get this, this really high compositional data, which is informative, but subtle trends are really difficult to see. It's really hard to condense this multivariate, this, this high dimensional data into information that you can use. So as an example of what we do to further these analyses, uh, this is a project we did with um, non-aqueous phase liquid degradation. And we've compressed that large amount of sequence data into a few dimensions where you know, points, these colored points represent you know, a sample, a composition of a sample. And these clear points on the right superimposed are the dominant taxa in that direction. So we have you know, these boxes in the upper right of this plot uh, show you know, unknown taxa that are correlated with this green set of samples. So that provides a little bit more context looking at entire sets of data together. But what about the ecology? What about what's going on in the ecosystem? Well, in the way this study design was set up, we can actually analyze the composition, which species are present, in connection with various environmental variables. In this case, uh, we looked specifically at the carbon concentration from the NAPL um, pollution. So here we have points. These are the species compositions represented in two dimensions. 
And the arrows are these environmental variables. So the correlation of these environmental variables with the structure of the community. And what this is telling us, we go from this very busy plot of the microbiome to a structure that tells us the NAPL spill, intentional spill in this case, it was a microcosm experiment. We see a massive increase in proteobacteria that resulted in a displacement of the natural community. So it tells us that there's something going on in that proteobacterial community that is responding to the increased NAPL concentration. So now we have a picture of you know, what is there, who is there, but now we need to understand what are they doing? So what functions are enriched? Uh, what functional profile is changing in response to some condition, some treatment or some response to some environmental change. And an end goal in a lot of cases is bioprospecting. Are there any features, unique genomic or species features that can be useful in biotechnology? <laughs> so this is the enzyme ACC deaminase. And it's an enzyme that found is found in a lot of plant growth promoting bacteria. So a lot of these bacteria will help plants by reducing the stress in their environment. Plants will have this stress ethylene and ACC deaminase will break down um, that stress ethylene, helping the plant manage that stress. And they also, these organisms also have a lot of other plant growth promoting genes. So we let ecology do a lot of the work when we develop these strains. And what you see here is two parallel enrichment cultures, one using a common nitrogen source, ammonia, and another using ACC. So this uh, intermediate of stress ethylene, this ACC is its own, the only nitrogen source. So you see over time on the left here, you have a crash in species diversity because you're enriching for those few organisms that can break down ACC. They have this ACC deaminase. And on the right-hand panel, you see that the species that get enriched in ACC get eliminated or stay very low in ammonia supplementation. So we are enriching for a few species that break down ACC, it allows us to screen entire large environments for those microorganisms that might have a specific function that we want. <clears throat> so what does that information does that give us? Well, it gives us a very broad model of ACC deaminase genes from our metagenome holdings. So this, all these blue points, these, uh, these blue sequences are a snapshot of the novel ACC deaminase genes, ACDS genes, in our microbiome holdings, the various metagenomes that we have uh, in, at Metagenome Bio. And that has allowed us to significantly expand the known structure space of this protein, of this ACC, ACC deaminase gene and gives us a better picture of what we're looking for, its function, and we can select for more efficient versions of this gene that give us better inoculants. So we do have this ability to do synthetic biology to insert these genes in other organisms, but right now this inoculant is just using ecology to do the work of isolating strong functioning inoculants that promote growth of plants. <laughs> and a third project that we found really interesting uh, is remediation. We had a group that approached us um, looking for organisms that degrade antifreeze, essentially, ethylene glycol degradation. And this is from uh, remediation ponds at airports that you know, de-ice planes and you have this um, effluent that has to be treated. And instead of letting 
UV and time do the degradation and some communities of microbes, can we isolate microbes that will jumpstart this solution or this situation, this remediation? So we did this study with a metagenome and we did something called metagenome assembled genomes where we can essentially create these genomes, filter large metagenomic databases for genomic information that we think can be statistically supported as belonging to the same organism. So these are bins, these are hypothetical genomes, but there's a lot of um, statistical evidence that they are actually representative genomes of organisms in this solution. And of these genomes that we recovered, we wanted to see, is there a pathway, the entire pathway of ethylene glycol degradation? And we found you know, several genomes, but one of these genome bids, bins had more or less strong hits to the full degradation pathway in one organism. <clears throat> and we also could develop a signature of this ethylene glycol degradation. So is there a way for us to use amplicon sequencing to screen large environments for the function or the ability to degrade ethylene glycol? So those two things in combination set the groundwork for developing these inoculants. So in summary, these, these signatures in microbiome analysis can be done on you know, a marker and epicon sequencing uh, scope where we can use taxonomic signatures that map to environmental variables. In the example was this proteobacteria the various proteobacteria species. So are there taxonomic groups uh, or even individual species that are signatures of a response to something in the environment, some treatment, some condition? And these can also be extended to specific functional signatures that are still amplicon data sets. That would be the example of the ethylene glycol gene, uh, degradation gene, core gene in that pathway. We can also use functional signatures through shotgun sequencing, where we screen the entire data set for specific genes or pathways we know should exist in the community. Enrichment can improve representative models. So we have better ACC deaminase gene models because of our enrichment cultures. And if we design experiments carefully, we can help identify core functions and pathways of interest, even when we do not know what they are. So we can make hypotheses about what these core functions are. And our current project that is putting a lot of this into action is, is healthy hydroponics, which is harnessing the harnessing microbiology to grow fresh, high quality produce, which takes a lot of these approaches we've talked about into monitoring health in hydroponic environments, which, you know, if we see in the panel on the bottom right, the difference between hydroponic and uh, open air agriculture uh, is significant in terms of diversity of organisms. So it's a contained environment in hydroponic systems, allowing this application to work a little more efficiently. And the current status of the project is, you know, we have uh, 13 to 14 farm microbiome profiles building this, this massive data set, which is hundreds of plant pathogens and hundreds and hundreds of samples, both amplicon and marker data that has developed our models of what is healthy in a hydroponic system. And we have improved identification of microorganisms and pathogens through our machine learning platform and linking this community to grower outcomes. And the team that's involved in this project, the core team, uh, the executive uh, on the top and the directors at, um, on the bottom here and project managers. And this is a project headed by Metagenome Bio and our association with the universities in the area who are these students uh, listed below. And I'd like to thank you very much for listening. And I know that we have uh, the capacity to help um, individual projects in the mining community. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Doc. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael uh, Lynch, for that uh, presentation. Uh, we'll certainly have some questions for you uh, once we get into the question and answer period. Uh, now, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our 
next two speakers who are going to be co-presenters. And uh, this is going to be Dr. Kelly Martin and Dr. Varun Gupta. And they'll be speaking to us about mining and microbes, translating research into practice. Uh, Dr. Martin, please go ahead. Thank you, Charles. Well, I, we're absolutely delighted to continue this conversation today. And I just wanted to point out that uh, Dr. Gupta and I are both uh, trained researchers who have recently moved into the private space. And we are incredibly motivated and actively integrating this uh, really advanced genomic knowledge into our clients who are generally large scale mining companies. Uh, programs to really enhance, enhance the understanding of their systems. At the end of today's chat, I hope you have three walkaway messages. The first is that you agree that microbiology significantly enhances our mechanistic understanding of our waters, but also that research is continuing to provide us with tangible microbial monitoring targets that can really facilitate proactive management. And I have a very specific example to show you today. And then uh, Dr. Varun Gupta will focus on how we can incorporate microbial knowledge into our treatment system to really enhance our confidence in their success, but also to increase adoption by regulatory bodies. So on the right there, you're seeing a framework, and it, I'm, I love that I'm seeing it over and over again by the presenters today. And is this idea that we can go at these mining water systems with the holistic, uh, holistic vantage point, where we do the water chemistry, we understand the toxicity, but then in tandem with that, we look at the microbes who are there, we look at their genes to figure out what they can do, and then we can leverage techniques like RNA to get at what they are actually doing. And this, uh, this idea of a sulfur risk, and that you've seen this figure in Dr. Warren's uh, image previously, but this idea of a sulfur risk is common across the global mining industry. We know that there's reactive sulfur compounds in our waters, they're in tailing impoundment caps, they're at discharge points, they're in receivers. When they undergo the microbial oxidation, we end up with environmental impacts like oxygen consumption and acidity and metal release, and then ultimately liability for the industry in the form of toxicity, failures, and in more extreme cases, even shutdowns. And so the term reactive sulfur compound came out of a publication that in 2020 and was presented at BC Mend just this past December. And it's this idea that in any droplet of water on a mine site, you would have two overarching pools. The first is sulfate. So that's where sulfur sits in our fully oxidized form. And then there's everything else. And everything else is reactive sulfur. It can be very complex pools, how it changes within that pool. Um, depends on the site, but the point is, is that everything in that reactive sulfur pool is hypothetically available for microbial oxidation. That study looked at mine sites across Canada, four in particular, looking at the receivers. And what we found is that with pretty much without exception, there was reactive sulfur making its way through treatment into a receiver. And quite importantly, that most of that reactive sulfur uh, pool was not resolved. So we didn't know actually which compounds it were. Now to the microbial piece. We have reactive sulfur now making its way to the receivers. And we know that when that occurs, cascades of reactions can begin because that's a very oxygenated environment. So you can have oxygen consumption and you can have acidity release through these kinds of reactions that you're seeing here. But the question is, if that's microbially mediated, are there early microbial indicators that can give us a proactive vantage point where we can see these reactions are beginning or about to begin and then make management decisions that can mitigate that? And the answer is yes. So the MWS project, which Dr. Warren nicely outlined for us, was is really been tasked with this idea that we can take this holistic vantage point, apply it to active mine sites, and gain really novel information. What that project has done, or at least one of the first major significant findings among many others, is that a group of organisms called Halothiobacillus 
are proactive indicator organisms that are not only correlated with the early onset of acidity generation, that they are actually driving it. And in 2019, that paper was published where we found halothiobacillus was, again, not only ubiquitous across the mining sites we investigated, but that it was directly responsible for circumneutral conditions driving to lower pH. And so here you're seeing that community distribution amongst four mining sites, mine one, two, three, and four, in input waters, a tailing reservoir waters, and the receiving waters. The first thing we saw was certainly a correlation. Halothiobacillus was absolutely higher in waters where there was lower pH, so pH around four. And conversely to that, in circumneutral conditions, they were present, but they were in lower abundance. So that's our correlation piece. But we want to get to mechanism and we want to get to causality, because if we can do that, we're in a much stronger position to begin managing impacts. And so those waters and those communities under laboratory incubations were given reactive sulfur in the form of thiosulfate under oxygenated conditions. What we found was that absolutely thiosulfate was rapidly consumed without uh, exception. pH dropped from seven to three in the, in the incubations where halothiobacillus took off to outcompete everyone else in those in those waters and drive um, and drive those circumneutral conditions to pH 4. But I use the term proactive and I think that's really important because if we can get at proactive indicators again we can really empower us to make management decisions and so a paper that's going to be published in Nature Communications this summer among um, among other findings, found that, in fact, the changes in biology was preceding the pH declines on the order of months. Oops. This is a four-year study, and it was carried out in a tailings impoundment in Sudbury, Ontario, from 2015 to 2018, and it applied this approach to the waters within that study. And while there were other findings, certainly I'd love to chat about that, one of the ones I wanna focus on is this, this proactive indicator. So in 2016, 2017, there was unexplained declines in pH to as low as 4.7 throughout this tailing reservoir. What's really important is that there were no major operational changes. Nothing drastic happened on this mine site that would explain that. And there was also no major changes in the water chemistry. So we had to go to the microbiology. What we found was very much in line with the 2019 study. And then in fact, the waters where there was lower pH also had halothiobacillus abundances that were significantly higher. So if we went to 2017 and we monitored the microbiology starting in June of that year, we would see that the halothiobacillus abundances were absolutely elevated on the order of months before any of the pH drops. And the pH is the symptom, right? The microbiology is the cause. And we need to get to the cause as an industry. And so what do we know about these particular group of organisms? They're certainly not only correlated, but they're driving declining pH. Really importantly, though, these are neutrophiles, which means that they do not persist under acidic conditions. This likely explains why if you were to do a lit search of halothiobacillus three, four years ago, you would not find it in the mining literature, which has been largely focused on AMD conditions, not the precursors. And then in 2020, and actually in 2021, Lopes and, and colleagues found the, the same organism in the presence, oh, sorry, the presence of this organism in a Portugal polymetallic mine, which is uh, quite exciting because that means that we likely are demonstrating a global distribution. And that's pretty much in line with what we know actually about AMD environments and that we see the same kind of organisms no matter where you are in the world colonizing and driving those conditions. And with that, I will pass it to my colleague who will speak to the semi-passive uh, semi treatment systems.
Great. Um, thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm yes. So I'm going to focus my talk on uh, like how incorporation of microbial knowledge into semi-passive treatment system can enhance their success and their their adoption by by uh, regulatory bodies. So there are a lot of examples or technologies out there that utilizes biological principles for treatment, like pit lake, BCR, saturated rock fill, constructed wetland, and the treatment can be for nitrate seal, like it can be for nitrate, selenium, and other uh, metals or contaminants. But even though we know that these systems are working, there are regulatory challenges that come up during the permitting process, uh, especially for these these biological semi-passive treatment systems. Um, and the main challenges identified by regulators include inadequate prediction, treatment effectiveness, water collection management, and residual waste management. I don't have time to go over every one of them, so I'm just gonna focus on inadequate prediction, which relates to overall of uh, uh, the longevity and limited understanding of underlying treatment mechanisms and more importantly, control mechanisms. So once again, so we know that these systems work and, and, and most of the treatment processes are driven, are driven either aerobically or anaerobically by uh, microbes. But even then, the underlying microbiology is still viewed sometimes as a black box which can lead to uncertainty around treatment potential and overall uh, reliability. So, we, so as we start to use biotechnology tools, we can start to demystify the black box and allow for greater mechanistic understanding of treatment. So I'm actually going to focus more on constructed wetlands to highlight how we can improve our understanding. Um, I actually did this uh, research with Dr. Nadia Makachuk who presented earlier in the, in the workshop. So when you think constructive wetlands, you start thinking plants and plants micro interactions. And specifically, a lot of focus is placed on microbial communities associated with rhizosphere. But little attention is paid to the bulk soil. That is, you know, that forms majority of the volume of the overall treatment. Um, and, and when you're thinking from treatment perspective, you want to, you know, you like you want to focus on bulk soil so you can properly extrapolate a, a treatment at a large scale. So what you're seeing here is, so during my experiment, um, I focused on three different plant types: uh, Carex lacustris, Typhalida folia, and Juncus canadensis. Um, and what you see here is like in the first year. Uh, there was really no difference in bulk soil microbial communities for the entire year. But in the second year, you can start to see that the microbial communities are starting to diverge and you can start pick up a plant influence on the underlying microbial communities. Um, I was really focused on sulfate reduction and sort of cycling. Um, so when I only looked for so uh, microbes that are involved in sulfur cycling, uh, what I noticed was in like in the first year, about three to nine percent of microbial communities could be act could be attributed to microbes involved in sulfur cycling. But by next year in 2017, that number increased to eight to 24 percent. So that was like close to a threefold increase in sulfur cycling microbes. And more importantly, I saw that Typha latifolia and Juncus oh, uh, and Carex both stimulated SRB population uh, and Juncus canadensis actually suppressed SRBs compared to the unplanted control. And that was very interesting finding. And more importantly now, okay, so we, so we can start picking up these microbial influences there, but we can also start to merge microbial community with water chemistry because a lot of time when we look at microbial data there is like you you like you wonder like you know how can we explain all the differences but when you start to combine uh, these like the pro water the pro water chemistry with microbial data um, you know we were able to explain about 45 percent 
of microbial differences were driven by water chemistry, but which is also in turn is influenced by plants. So there is multi-layered effect that you have to consider. So I think that the, like the key take home message is like microbiology is intertwined with, with water chemistry and other macro influences like plants and substrate. Understanding interconnectedness between these systems and then using microbiology to, to connect different domains lead to more predictable treatment and can help you know, increase confidence in a given technology to move it along piloting and demonstration phase. Um, with that, um, you know, we will end up on presentation here. And if you have any questions, we are happy to answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation um, to you both, uh, Dr. Martin and uh, Dr. Gutta, Gutta uh, for the presentation. Um, now we're gonna move into our question and answer period. And uh, so over the next 20 minutes, we're going to uh, go through a series of questions to the speakers and also um, from, from the audience. And then we can sort of um, also go into some wrap up a little bit later on. Um, I guess my first question is going to be directed towards Dr. Leslie uh, Martin. And the question is, can you speak to the energetic favorability of the final chemistry of the water? And I guess in the context of when you mentioned the fast, slow uh, catalysis metabolic pathways. Right. Uh, this is a great question. I was just starting to, to try to type a, an answer to this. Um, so obviously microbes are in the business of always doing energetically favorable reactions. They need to gain energy, but there are often, um, you know, and if, if you're speaking sort of from a redox perspective, this idea that different reactions, there's more free energy associated with them. I think that what we see with the fast and the slow is that there are ecological niches at play here. So the fast guys are gonna get more energy, but they would work under conditions where they're probably not limited in terms of sulfur substrate, because if they're converting all of the sulfur to sulfate, it's a little bit like nuclear fuel, it becomes spent if you're an oxidizer. So they work well when there's lots of oxygen and basically they're, they're sort of, you know, lots of free energy available. The slow guys are working under more uh, geochemically diverse conditions. So maybe not as much oxygen. A lot of their reactions are back reactions, they're recycling reactions. So they may not gain as much energy, but what we're seeing is that they can sort of um, ecologically outcompete the fast guys under conditions where um, th there's maybe not as much sulfur substrate to begin with, definitely under low oxygen. We've also seen though that things like nitrate will actually speed up the rate of the, the slow guys. So I, I think energetics is a really important piece to this. I don't have all, I don't have a clear model for you, but I think we have to start bringing in this idea of ecological niches that I think bugs are, are making some trade-offs here genetically and sort of evolutionarily speaking that, you know, I'm a, I only do this one thing. I do it really well and I'll compete and outcompete everybody under these certain conditions versus I'm more of a generalist. I'm going to play with these pathways and that allow, I don't maybe get as much energy, but I can, I can cover off under conditions where other guys can't play. Um, so that's kind of would be my answer to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, the next question, I'm not sure exactly who it's targeting, but I think one of you should just pipe mm -hmm. up with an answer here. And the question is, um, could you please comment on the role of electrons in bioreactors? I think the example given here is selenium reduction process that adds electrons to the bioreactor to achieve uh, 1.0 parts per billion. Uh, can some bioreactor processes performance be enhanced using this concept? Who would like to take a, a, a shot at that question? If we had Dr. Sue Baldwin on the line <laughs> yesterday, that is a question specifically for her since she works on those selenium bioreactors with tech, but I don't believe okay. she's here today. But okay. I think we could, we could pass that question on to her because she would do it. Uh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, one point I would, would just throw in is that, you know, you know I, I think 
thinking that's a that's a challenging thing to do electrons it's not like adding a chemist chemical right electrons kind of get transferred so you know you'd have to be thinking about reactions that would allow you to do that which is essentially what bugs are doing right they're they're transferring electrons from one thing to the other and in the process they gain energy so i think that that's a bit tricky i know that there has been some work done in sort of can you essentially use reservoirs essentially just as a big um uh, basically, you can just essentially push the redox potential to the one you want using sort of different electrodes. And I think, you know, I think all of those are possible, but it, it would take some research to figure out, could you make it work? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, the next question is a, a question for, um, uh, for, my, for my, Dr. Michael Lynch. And Dr. Michael, the question is, I think uh, you mentioned something about, um, you know, airports and sort of the wastewater around the airports and how you can accelerate some of the reaction times to degrade uh, the chemicals used by airports. Is that, can you maybe comment on, you know, what happens with, for example, with runoffs from farms and also runoffs from the road system with the salt that is in, uh, is on the roads. Is there a, a microbial solution to that problem as well? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you um, for the question. Uh, I'd like to start off by, by extending, um, some comments by um, Leslie just a minute ago is that it's these communities that we're finding matter a lot. These niche, the niche, niche differentiation, we have a lot of you know, conditions where one organism is favored and you slightly change the conditions and another organism gets favored. So we find that we you add an inoculant to a system and sometimes it takes off, other times it attenuates and doesn't do a lot in the system. So understanding the set of organisms, how they interact and how they respond to the environment makes a more stable um, inoculant. Uh, the, applying this uh, approach to um, like reclamation or remediation or, or such things, really it's all about where or what organisms kind of evolve to degrade these compounds and what conditions are optimal for them. So we find a lot more success uh, enriching for environments that already have, you know, the, the target molecule in them, you know, the same way that uh, degradation of, of oil spills targets organisms, you develop the organisms from places where oil spills naturally occur, um, seepage, for example. Uh, so yes, there is the potential that naturally occurring organisms can be used in remediation and reclamation. Uh, there is also a, the more we study, the more we get better models of pathways, the more accessible synthetic biology is to those problems. And I see us moving there as well. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Michael, for that. Um, does anybody want to, any, does anybody want to follow up on maybe some of Dr. Warren's comments from the past question? Or can we move on to the next question? Okay, looks like we'll move on to the next question. Okay, next question is, uh, how can uh, or is eDNA and current microbial research applied to mine reclamation? I think we just uh, went, went through that question. Um, I think we're moving on to the follow-up there. The, oh, sorry. No, that's... Th th there you go. Okay, um, next question is from John Clark again is, uh, please comment on impact assessment and subsequent permitting depends significantly on ARD slash ML, current prediction methods, but over the longer term, is there potential that new microbes will infiltrate tailings and waste rock and turn on acid generation materials to acid generating materials? Uh, I, can, ahead, I, can, I can start maybe the, <laughs> the discussion there. So, Absolutely, when we're thinking about mine sites, the industry, when they're talking about acid generation, immediately goes to MLARD. That's what we're good at. That's what the regulatory space is designed to do, is to look and whether it's humidity cells or feed leach barrels and, and try and understand what's going to happen with that solid material. What I would argue we are much less good at is as that water moves through the system is the sulfur processes that occur as that as the, the, we move down 
path. And that's where I think this idea of microbial influence, along with actually what's happening in the rock material itself, but what is it and what new microbes are going to begin cycling and potentially causing risk as that water moves through your system and five years from now and 10 years from now and 20 years from now and really using that microbial lens and as we've heard that microbial ecology lens to understand under which conditions will these microbes establish and where might you um, be able to predict future risk. I, and, and so that monitoring piece, you know, where we integrate this into not just reclamation is, of course, the rehabilitation, but it's also the monitoring and making sure that really we're really good at understanding our mechanisms and understanding at being predictive of what's going to happen. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Kelly, for that answer. Does anybody have any follow up or follow on to that answer from Kelly? All right. Okay, move on to the next question. Do you need this? I guess it's about uh, conversation about regulations uh, and uh, uh, licensing. Uh, the question here is: Do you need special licenses in using and applying different microbes in mining projects? Uh, and in particular, maybe even give a comment on international borders. Is there any differences between working in Canada versus other countries? I can uh, speak to this a little bit with some of my experience. Our experience okay. um, in in hydroponics and agriculture, yes, there are regulations in place. You have to demonstrate, um, especially when it comes to food systems, you have to demonstrate that it's not hazardous, um, not dangerous, not uh, affects the um, community in negative ways. Um, a lot of this is helped by our approaches of, of enriching um, material from the site of interest. You know, we're not introducing or tend not to introduce completely novel organisms to an environment, but rather things that naturally occur. Um, and the barrier for use is obviously small or well, I guess larger uh, when using synthetic biology as opposed to a naturally occurring organism. And thirdly, there are different regulations in different countries. Um, getting approval in the US is considerably easier than in Canada for um, some things. So I'm not sure specifically about mining though. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, um, Michael. Does anyone else want to add on to that answer? I think I think I just want to add one additional so, uh, idea to that is, is something this should be as part of the discussion when we think about larger applications and whether that's consortia of defined natural organisms to treat very large mine sites or this synthetic biology and sort of engineering strains with particular characteristics, either in bioreactors or applied in nature, is that a lot of the regulatory framework is based on food or agriculture or health applications. And there isn't language right now around the application of bacteria in mining situations in particular. So we're already doing this. And we're, we're starting to scratch the surface on application of synthetic microbes, but we have to have that conversation with the regulatory body so that that regulatory approval follows with any of these applications that we're trying to develop. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Kelly, did you want to say something? I thought I saw you wanted to speak there. Oh, oh sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. I okay. just, I'm actually interested in, maybe this is a question more than a comment for the rest of the panel, but this idea of, um, you know, I'm wondering about the, the success in terms of when you start synthesizing and start playing with uh, genomes versus using that in situ sort of native community and really understanding that community and then driving it as Michael is saying and in different ways based on what we know about the microbial ecology. I was wondering um, what you guys think about, about if there's a, you know, a time and place for both about the success stories or anything like that. Um, yeah, I can jump in quickly. The okay. There's definitely, I kind of see it as a, a time and place uh, both have their their roles especially when it is a constrained pathway a simple pathway that does well in model organisms so there are several different kind of landing paths there are different platforms you can use 
to develop these synthetic organisms on. And as long as um, you know there are smaller pathways that are uh, well understood to work well with the um, model organisms, then we've had a lot of success uh, both in academia and in industry of, of using those. Uh, when we get up to the consortia, you know, using multiple species, obviously steering the natural community is more efficient. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Okay, um, Leslie, did you unmute yourself or are you okay? <laughs> yep, no, I'm fine. You're fine, okay. All right, okay. The next question here is uh, from uh, Alcy Haley. The answer is, uh, is there research into the role of different physical substrates present in tailings, um, i.e. particulate matter, may support metabolic interactions, um, i.e. interspecies electron transport, or alternatively constrain the possible metabolism because the majority of the metabolism is occurring on the particles rather than the aqueous phase. Uh, anyone want to take a, a shot at that question? Well, I'll, I'll start, um, you know, for sure there's research happening. And I think one of the, the situ and I understand the, the, the perception might be that, you know, university researchers are aware of all the research that's going on. Um, of course, we're not. Um, and these studies are happening ad hoc. And they're definitely, I know, you know, my group has, has done some of this, and you're absolutely right. You know, the, I think the way we often think about it is that it could be on particles, it also can be on any kind of density difference, right? So if you think about salt water, versus fresher water, but also temperature differences, that creates essentially analogous to a solid surface. And so wherever you have those possible interfaces, you have microbes that collect and there's often energetic gradients there. Um, and so you see that kind of research being done and, and the scale of process is microbial. So, you know, one to two microns maybe. Um, and then the impact scales to bulk system. So you may see the symptom, you know, up in the upper waters, but it's scaling there. And we need all of this kind of research to be happening because we know that these, these particles are really important, um, but it requires coordinated uh, long-term research plans that recognize the value of this and, and resource it appropriately. Because, you know, people are doing studies ad hoc with, you know, different companies um, and it may get published in the academic literature, which I know essentially means then it's, you know, it's a black box to industry. They may never see what the relevance of that is. So, you know, I think particularly as Nadia has sort of spoken to, we need some of these incubator ecosystems that are interfacing research with industry better so that these there's more transparency it's a, it's a it's a communal risk we need to leverage everybody's findings to try to move this you know forward more more quickly but there are definitely studies that have looked at some of this but it's very ad hoc at least to my to my knowledge okay thank you leslie anyone else want to pipe in on that answer Okay, I have a question here for uh, Dr. Nadia Mitichak. The question is, in terms of timelines or development of timelines for the Center for Mine Waste Biotechnology, when do you sort of see the center potentially being open and operational mm -hmm. to work with clients? That's an exciting question since I literally got my business case from my consultants this week. So I now have the blueprint, uh, I have the price tag, and now it's going to be the March of getting all the funds in place and all the partners in place to be able to break ground and hopefully develop the center within two years. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Okay. We have a, a, another question here from Emmanuel Wangoma. Uh, the statement that Emmanuel makes is that uh, mutations will always occur. Uh, it always occurs in these populations, given that microbes uh, do their reactions for self-preservation. And then the, the statement is: Shouldn't it be important to track the changes? preserve the species that could be beneficial to our own processes without necessarily stopping the mutation. Anyone want to take a shot at that answer? I could, I could start. Yeah. And I Go think ahead. Michael was just about to jump in, but <laughs> I think it, it goes back to the discussion we were just having of sort of defining a, a target microbial consortium versus a synthetic microbe that we might engineer with what we think are the best traits. Um, but unless we build in sort of controls on that, it's very likely that that microbe, like every other microbe, once in the environment might acquire different traits or mutate and move away from sort of the ideal organism that we built. 
The same is true of natural consortia. And so I think the important piece to consider here is that those microbes and those communities and even synthetic organisms are dynamic living systems and mutation is part of that nat natural evolution in response to pressures from their environment. So by throwing something, let's say we create the best inoculum and we throw it at an environment, we have to continue monitoring both the organisms, the consortia and, and the geochemistry that they're driving to make sure that they're still doing what we intended them to do in different systems. So it's not gonna be a develop a solution, here's the outcome that genomics tool and microbial approach is still going to be important as we monitor these different applications in the field in, in real time and over time. Okay, thank you. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, I would echo the same thing. You, we need to monitor performance and composition over time, and that's going to get easier with the more the decrease in sequencing costs and cost of managing sequencing data. Uh, just, it just reminds me of, of a lot of the, the Lensky experiment, the um, e. coli, e. coli uh, replication um, over decades uh, and how these organisms evolve uh, and have, have new ecologies and new functions. So yes, uh, definitely should, monitoring should be part of it, but monitoring for not just composition, but for performance. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Okay, we are at the last minute of our, of our panel session here. And what I'm gonna do is ask each panel member uh, in maybe under 25 seconds each, if possible, uh, if you can just maybe throw out what some of your future ideas for biotechnology and mining, and then we can have a wrap from there. So I'm gonna pick uh, Nadia, please go ahead. Uh, do you sort of 25 second wrap up of the future of biotechnology and mining? What are your parting thoughts? We're going to see the mining industry change at an accelerated rate with the demand for critical minerals and our response to electrification and climate change. And so this kind of discussion that we're having today, bringing all the different stakeholders together is critical to answering the challenges that are present now and are only going to grow over the coming decades. So it's an exciting time to be in this field, and I encourage more people to jump into the sandbox. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nadia. Uh, Dr. Leslie Warren, please go ahead. Sure, you know, I, I completely um, echo Nadia's comments. And the second thing I'd say is, you know, this is an industry that classically and famously is often said, everybody rushes to be second. Well, you know, I think that the power of genomics and metagenomics has been shown in every other sector. So now you're rushing to be, you know, don't be last. I think the timing is great. Cost is down, it's there, get on board because th these are the tools that will change things. Thank you, Dr. Warren, appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Lynch, please go ahead. Yeah, I agree with what's been said this thus far, and also um, it's the integration of all data sets together. Um, mm -hmm. So the consilience, just bringing all data together to create better models that get us further in application in this translational knowledge. And Thank as you. it's been successful in other fields, and I think uh, mining is is a good discipline right now for it. All right. Thank you for that. And uh, uh, second last, uh, Dr. Gupta, please go ahead, and then we'll we'll go to Dr. Martin to close it off. I I would say like like definitely bio mining is where things are going as well like because all of the uh, resource limitations we are getting and also you know under like like uh, using tools to un like actually predict where things are going and okay. so have more proactive treatment. Excellent, thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Martin, please go ahead and close us off. So just to, just to close it off, you know, I think the industry is primed for a paradigm shift. We have the expertise in the academic world um, that are ready to support and are already supporting that. And I think it's going to be thrilling in the next, you know, five, 10 years, even this, this year, to see really the advances that are going and to seeing the appetite coming from the industry themselves. So. All right, thank you everybody. I would like to just uh, thank the audience for joining us today and thank the panelists for sharing their thoughts and their wisdom and their findings. And uh, look, I think we're all looking forward to a greener, cleaner mining industry. And I think biotechnology is definitely going to make that happen. So on that note, everybody have a good day. Thank you so much, stay safe. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in our next webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.